Today, it's a sort of little celebration, in a way, this lecture, because um, for the first time we have the chance to do research on a topic that we were that we have been waiting for a long time to start, and now we managed to get uh, a grant for doing it. So this is like the opening celebration, you know, of this research project. The title of the of the project is Chemical Organization Theory and its application to the complexity stability problem. So. What I'll do first is to get some background to get to the complexity stability problem and then I will introduce chemical organization theory which is the framework that we want to use to uh, attack this problem. And later we will go a little more into the actual proposal that we have for, for our research project and get to conclusions and yeah, just like normal structure of a lecture. So let's go to the very basic definitions. What do we understand for an ecosystem? So an ecosystem is a community, this is the definition, community of living organisms and non-living components, such as air, water, mineral, soils, etc., interacting as a system. So we see three important concepts here. First is community, second interacting, and third system. If we go a little bit more into detail of what these things are, a community is an association or assemblage of populations of two or more different species, 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 species occupying the same geographical area and in a particular time. So we need to have some, imagine some sort of different things interacting um, in a certain place and time. So this is about local, things occur local, but different things uh, interact in a local way. And then by interaction, we have this definition in ecology, if effect that organisms have on one another. Mm -hmm. So we have different organisms in the same place doing things to one another, the interacting. And then system, remember we are defining what an ecosystem is, so we need the word system. A system is a set of interacting entities forming a complex whole. So this community, it's formed by, uh, or it exists by interactions between the entities and they form a complex whole. So this is just basic definitions, but these are very useful to, to come up with this conclusion. Is that ecosystems exist because their interactions create for, uh, complex holes? So this is just like one direct question you can ask from the very definitions of the elements that play a role in what an ecosystem is. So, so by complex, I put this image to explain because normally when we learn for the first time what an ecosystem is, we, we get this new hierarchical view, that pyramid, a food pyramid or tropic, tropic chain, that the eagle eats the mice, the mice eats the, eats the plant, and, and so on. We go by levels and we identify a sort of hierarchy, and, and we think of ecosystems as hierarchical. But later, if you think a little bit more, we find that this structure is not, is not representative of what really happens in an ecosystem. So we have, this is the, the typical example of a food web where things have a more, are way more interrelated and it's not so easy to define levels. So it's not that one thing eats the other because you can have one, one species that eats something that is two levels below and one level below at the same time, so there is no such a thing as a hierarchy. And we have this image which, which shows like the classical example of a food web to, to explain uh, the complex interactions or the interwoven interactions at the food trophic level. So we are just thinking here about who eats who. We are not thinking about other uh, types of interactions that occur in an ecosystem. But just by looking at the trophic, level, trophic uh, layer of an ecosystem, we already see the complexity. So we go, we're going to advance more into the, in, on this later. 
Okay, so now we, we, we go to the complexity stability debate. First of all, ecological systems are faced with species extinctions and invasions. So this is something that is becoming, or it's, it's very important at the moment to understand how ecosystems vary with these cha changes. So if one species is extinct, is the entire ecosystem going to collapse, or is it going to resist, or is it going to adapt? So these are the types of questions behind um, the current context of global warming and, and so on. So in theoretical ecology, people ask whether or not is the complexity of the ecosystem the feature that brings stability to it. So we need to, like, the question is whether ecosystems uh, are stable because of their complexity and what is going to happen with an ecosystem if we change its complexity. And this question is known as the complexity stability problem or complexity stability debate. Now, to understand better what do we mean by stability and what do we mean by complexity, we have measures of it, because this is a scientific question, so the concepts involved are measurable. So by stability, we have some indicators of stability, which is, oh, I think, okay, so these are mixed. So by complexity, excuse me here, by complexity, we have a list of features like diversity, richness, connectivity, and etc. And by stability, we have resilience, resistance, robustness, adaptivity, and this, uh, there's a long list for each of them. And at the moment, we have here definitions that, that make sense if we think, okay, diversity in an ecosystem, of course, it can be the number of species. But we can also have diversity of interactions or by resilience. We know that resilience is somehow a measure of how do you respond um, after a certain perturbation is in the system occurs. But what do we exactly mean by number of species? Is number of species I interact with, number of species that we have in the, ecos in the entire ecosystem, or the average number of interactions? In so there are different measures of for or different ways to measure all these concepts that make sense in a natural language sense, make a lot of sense, but not necessarily have a proper analytic definition. That is what we need in theoretical ecology. So what happened with this debate? I will tell the story very short. This is a, a, a sentence from a summary of this debate that started in the late 50s, I will say 60s, and it lasts for many decades. And one of the best uh, summaries done in 1994 says, early studies suggested that simple ecosystems were less stable than complex ones, but later studies came to the opposite conclusion. So people thought before that, in the beginning, that complexity br brings stability to the ecosystem, but then other people discovered that actually random networks seem to be more stable than non-random networks, and then the, the debate Began, and some people have supported the some, one view. Other people have supported the other view, and this has become a debate in the literature. But at the at the moment, it remains unsolved. So now we will go briefly to cover how people think of this problem. How do they study? What do they? What what method they use to to think of this? Because this is the the bottom line of the lecture is to proce present a different way to think of this problem, not just to discuss, just to think it differently. Okay, so the, fir the first um, method is, I put the word equations here, because I don't want to, it's not going to be a technical lecture, so I just say equations, okay? Of course, these are, most of you know that these are differential equations, but for, for someone who doesn't know what a differential equation is, just an equation, just some mathematical formula. Okay, so this is the typical lotka volterra equation that represents a predator-prey system. So we have two species here, the fox and the rabbit, and we can see the population of the fox and the rabbit in time described by this equation, who, which, and this equation is meant to represent how they interact. 
as populations, how the population of rabbits interact with the population of foxes. So the problem of this method, so we're going to go really quick on these methods. The problem of this method is that it can only be solved for small ecosystems, because if, we, if you think of a big ecosystem, you will have many, many equations here, and all these equations will be very big, because there are many species interacting. So what happens for some peop people who know about complexity a little bit, you will have a system of highly coupled and non-linear equations, which do not have analytic solution. So then all the gain of this, you can, you can plot the equation, you can make a numerical method, analyze it, build these curves, but then you change one parameter slightly and you don't know what's going to happen. So it's not a good uh, method for understanding broadly what happens uh, with an ecosystem. It's illustrative for small ecosystems, but for large ecosystems it doesn't really work as a methodology to understand the complexity stability problem. So, next, another um, method is to use network models. So in a network model you can provide an analytic description of the interaction by means of a link. So you connect with a link everything that interacts. So every couple of things that interact, you make a link. And the, and the arrow in this case means is eaten by, in this example. So sun energy is eaten by the plant and then the grasshopper eats the plant and then you can continue checking uh, this uh, it, it's eaten by relationship. And you can build a network that represents, at least in this case, the trophic interactions between species in an ecosystem. And then you can use all network theory to, to analyze the complexity stability debate, the, the complexity stability problem. You use techniques from network models. But there is one big problem here, is that the links can represent one type of interaction at the time. And in ecological interactions have different shapes. It's not the same type of interaction to have a, a trophic relation or a symbiotic relation. So if, for example, sun and plant exist in a symbiotic relationship, this means that both benefits from their interaction, then you will have to use another arrow, let's say a red arrow, to represent symbiotic. And then you have some red arrows, some blue arrows, but then what do you do with this? The structure of these arrows is not clear. So the analytic method applies only for... Um, one type of interaction, and this is also a recognized problem in the same case that in the previous method with dynamical equations, you have the problem of, of uh, non-analytic solutions for large systems. Here, you know, it's, it's well known that, the pro that this type of method cannot encompass many types of interactions at the time. And then the third, the third method, uh, most popular method, is the agent-based model, which it's a sort of, you, you create uh, a, a universe with the, with the aid of computers. You can create an ecological universe and you define uh, species that exist in this universe. You define rules of behavior, you define an environment as it is shown here, and then you let the system evolve according to the rules of, uh, of action of the agents. And this can also, uh, you can incorporate different types of interactions, different types of entities, and you, by, by just setting the right rules, you will have the evolution of the system. Because the computer computes it for you. So this is really good for making simulations and understanding certain behaviors, but lacks of analytic, analytic methods of study. Because for each rule you have to set a parameter. This is also a, a little technical. But in the end, you, in the end you have a, 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 let's say a large list of parameters to tune. And in order to know what happened, if you change one parameter, one condition of the system, you have to run another simulation or many simulations to see statistically what happens if your model is probabilistic and so on. So it's good for making cases for explanatory purposes, but it's not really good to understand deeply what would happen in a large ecosystem with many interactions. It doesn't have any analytic uh, way to analyze it. So, 
Um, what have happened in the last years, and I'm speaking by last years, like last year, so 2015, 2016, um, scholars have concluded that this problem has been misunderstood. The, the whole, the entire debate for 30 years have been misunderstood because there is a dominant unidimensional view, which is mainly because I didn't tell this but before, but the network models are the dominant models to debate this problem. So agent-based model and dynamical equations are, in a way, um, I would say, marginal in the entire discussion. Most, most of the discussions has, has been carried within the network model uh, framework, which, as I said before, was unidimensional because it encompassed only one interaction at a time. So this is a, a quote of a really like a December 2016 paper in the Ecology Letters, which is a very uh, important journal in this uh, field. So we assessed, and, and actually it's not meant just for scholars, this is also for policy making and like companies and like for, for the broader discussion outside the academic community, but also in, for policy making and global warming people and so on. So, oh, how come we, come we that? I, Okay, so we assess the scientific and policy literature and show that this disconnect is one consequence of an inconsistent and one-dimensional approach that ecologists have taken to both disturbances and stability. This has led to confused communication of the nature of stability and the level of our insight into it. Disturbances and stability are multidimensional. Our understanding of them is not. So this is basically a strong call for a multidimensional approach to study ecosystems. If we see, okay, I will make a little summary now to, to sort of wrap up what we have been discussing. We have the complexity stability debate, so how um, an ecosystem uh, reacts under changes in complexity, which means adding or um, or extracting species from the system or strong changes in, in certain conditions. So, we have these three frameworks, dynamical equations, networks, and agent-based modeling, and we can see some features that we need in order to study properly the problem. We need to have many species, many interactions, we need to understand properly the dynamical evolution of the system, we need to be able to study the mechanisms or the different types of interactions that occur in the system, and also we must have analytic tools to provide theoretical uh, power. So if we look at the dynamical equations, we have all the analytic tools, mechanisms, dynamical evolution, but we cannot have many species and many interactions. In networks, we have many species, but only one type of interaction at a time. We do not have dynamical evolution, although we can study certain things, but I won't go into that. We don't have mechanisms because we only encompass one type of interaction. And the analytic tools are rich because network theory has, is very rich in, in, in theoretical tools. Agent-based modeling has many species, many interactions. You can do a dynamical evolution by making uh, simulations. Your mechanisms of description are partial in the sense that you can establish rules of interaction, but there is no um, um, a strong way to represent these uh, mechanisms as you have in the case of dynamical equations. So I said partial because it's not as, as strong as in this case, and it's not also no, so it's kind of like in between. But the analytic tools are very poor because we only rely on simulations. And we need the holy grail or the golden theory that will have many species, many interactions, dynamical evolution, the capacity to put mechanisms inside the interactions, and also that you can have analytic tools to uh, study the problem. And what I will present from now on, it's something that most of you know very well, but this had probably have no, haven't thought about using it for studying this problem. So it's novel. Uh, the, what is novel is the angle. It's not really the approach. So we start now, and that's why chemical organization theory. It's I will introduce first. Now we go into the new section. If you see here, chemical organization theory. So first of all, I will introduce 
what a reaction network is. So we start now with a very basic uh, uh, chemical reaction, the formation of water. So this, this reaction represents the formation of water. Explain more like notationally or algebraically, this is more graphically. So now I want you to think or to have in mind a large reaction network. This means that you will have many molecular species and many reactions or let's say interactions. So you can create more reactions and have this interrelation between different uh, reaction, reactions and what a list of reactions that share species in the reactant and products is known as a reaction network and it's the, I will say, the dominant framework to represent metabolisms or systems biology in general and the problems of emergence of life or autopoiesis we must, we all know a little bit about this here and so on. So the reaction network is the, let's say like the, the, the current framework to study these problems. This could change but at the moment it's like this and it works pretty well. So, if we, uh, now I was getting you to this, to think about reaction networks and I want you to get with the object of, the object of study will be the sub-networks of a very large reaction network. So this is important to keep in mind. The object of study are the sub-networks of a large reaction network and the goal is studying the relation between structure and dynamical stability of these sub-networks of a very large reaction network. Okay? So this is, this is the, the object of study and the goal of this. So now a little bit of more concrete definitions. A reaction network is, is composed by a set of species and a set of reactions, so N species and K reactions in general. So this can be very large and that's the idea in metabolism or um, in the type of systems that for those that the theory is meant to be used for, these numbers are large, the order of hundreds or thousands. So, important to understand, because I said we are going to study the subsystems, the subnetworks, it's very important to consider, to, to understand that when we take a subset of a species, so this C is a subset of M, this the subset activates a set that is contained in the total set of reactions. It's a, it's a, it's a very trivial thing, but it, it has to be very clear to, to keep going. So, for example, we have the very simple system that contains three species and one reaction, nothing else. A plus B goes to C. So, if I consider the set A, only A, I cannot trigger this reaction, so my reaction set is empty. While if I have A and B, my reaction set is this one, and if I have everything, my reaction set is this one. You can think of what will happen for the, with the other subsets, but it's important to, keep, to understand that when you take a subsystem, a subset of species of this reaction network, you will end up with a subset of reactions. And this can be always compute, and, it, and this set, of course, is, in this, is maximal. You can find a unique set of reactions that characterize a set of species because it's the maximum set. But now it's when things become more interesting. You can define a set of species to be closed if all the, pro the species that are produced by the reactions included in your set are already in your set. This I'm gonna, I, will, I will show an example to clarify this. And semi self maintaining is if every species that is consumed by the reaction set it's also created or produced by the reaction set. So if we take this example again, we take the set A again, and since the reaction set is empty, the, the, the species produced in RC are empty and they are in C, so the system is closed. But it's trivially closed because it doesn't react. And it's also trivially semi self maintained because nothing is consumed. So nothing is consumed, nothing is produced, it's trivially closed and trivially self maintained But if we look for a little bit more uh, complicated set, like AB, we see that it's not closed, 
because A and B create C. So it's not closed. It has to be closed at in C. And it's not semi self maintained because both species are consumed by the reaction set and nothing is produced. And then if we take C, the, the case ABC, we have that the set is closed but it's not semi self maintained. So these properties seem to be very simple but are not. Uh, one doesn't imply the other, none of them implies the other, and they are not as trivial as one would think in principle. So you take a, a, a large reaction network just to calculate the set of closed sets, so all the closed sets of a reaction network will tell you immediately what are the subsystems that can react within themselves and do not, have, do not produce new sets, do not produce new things. So this shows you a little bit, you can think already in a, in a closed ecosystem, some, an, an ecosystem that doesn't produce things that are not used inside. And then semi-self-maintaining is, is a sort of um, structural property for being uh, self-sustainable, because you need to produce all what you consume. But it's a, at a very simple level. Okay, so these are the structural properties. I, 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 need, I want to say something really quick, that reaction networks can be represented at different layers. This is the simplest layer possible. We do not have quantities, it's just what produces what. But now we will go to the next level and introduce the notion of a process. So a process is a, a specification of how the reactions will occur within a certain time interval. So we will say, now we have this reaction network with this process occurring in it which means these reactions happening in it. So, to make it very simple, again, um, well, I will, make, I will show an example, but it's important, again, to conceptualize this. A process implies a collective transformation of species within the network. The reactions occur in the whole network, and before the process you have one, one state or one at certain amounts or concentrations of the species in one side, and after the process occurs, you have another thing. So the process in itself defines a collective transformation of the species within the network. And so we will get back to, uh, well, a new example, a little bit more complicated to have quant uh, non trivial quantities involved. And we have these three reactions A, B, C again, but these three reactions A plus B equals to 2C. B plus C goes to 2A, A plus C goes to 2B. So the process in this case will be represented as a sequence of reactions. There are many ways to represent a process, but you will define it as a sequence of reactions in this case, um, because it's the simplest way, just, just to don't get too complicated. So the process R1 consumes one uh, species of type A, one species of type B, and consumes zero species of type C because R1 is just applying this reaction and produces 0A, 0B, and 2C. So we can notate this with vectors. You can already start understand that there is some linear algebra involved here, but we won't, we won't get to that. Just we'll show this example. Process R1, R2, so I apply R1 first and then R2, consumes 1A in this reaction, 2B, one here and one here, and 1C here, okay? And produces 2A and 2C, 2A and 2C, no B. And then process R1, R2, R3 consumes 2A, 2B, 2C, because AA, BB, and CC, and produces 2A, 2B, 2C, 2A, 2B, 2C. So, interestingly, this process, R1, R2, R3, produces exactly the same than what consumes. So we will define that a process within a network is self-maintaining if produces the same or more than what consumes. If we think before, semi-self-maintaining was something that all what is consumed can be produced. This is a specification of how something can be produced the same or more than what it is consumed. So this is a, uh, a linear algebraic property. So we need to, because just quick here for those interested, you can build a matrix with this system 
and then the process will be a vector that is multiplied with the matrix. So, but the, these are details I will skip on this talk. Okay, now we, we did this first level, which is structural. So we think only of what is produced, what is consumed, and we discover the property of closure, closure and semi-self-maintaining. Then we incorporated the processes and we discovered the property of self-maintenance and there are many more properties to be defined but I will skip that. And now we go to the next level which is thinking of a reaction network as a dynamical system. So something that starts in a certain state, has certain rules of evolution and then you have a dynamical system. So you can represent the evolution of system by dynamical equations. So each species is uh, represented by a concentration which has a time zero, some concentration, and then evolves. And the processes occurring in the reaction network, so we were defining the processes before as uh, sequences of reactions, but now a process is a constant flow of reactions. And this uh, constant flow of reactions are ruled or defined by a kinetic law. The most popular law applied in chemistry is the mass action kinetics that tells the rate of a reaction so now reactions do not occur um, sequentially, they occur at a certain rate within the system. So this is continuous dynamics. So the rate of a reaction is directly pro proportional to the product of the concentrations of the reactants. It's a very way, simple way to state it. And, and I will just build the equation of the previous system. I will not explain here how to do it. It's very, it's, it's very simple, but it's not worth doing it now. And this is a differential equation that tells you how the concentration of A will change in time, how the concentration of B, and, okay. and then you can apply all the methods of dynamical systems to get fixed points and, and so on here. But we know that if we have a very large system, we won't be able to do much with that, because it's going to be too complex. So, as I said, this approach is untractable for large reaction networks. So, the, the question here, and this is what chemical organization theory is about, can we use the notion of self-maintaining process to understand the dynamics of a large reaction network? Because we saw that the self-maintaining process is just a, a matrix calculation. We only need to, to check what pathway will lead you to something that is self-sustaining. And, and this is what a uh, group in Germany developed. So they define this, this uh, property. An organization is a set of species that is closed and has self-maintaining processes. So you have a large reaction network and you identify a sub-network that is first closed and second that you can find self-maintaining processes within it. And then you have the following theorem. Fixed points of the dynamical equations of a reaction network <coughs> corresponds to set of species that are organizations. And this is, is I won't prove the theorem here, but it's, it's not so complicated to understand. Because if you have a fixed point, you cannot create anything new. You cannot be adding things to it, because otherwise it will change. So it won't be a fixed point. <coughs> Simple. Then you prove that it's closed. And then second, if you do not produce exactly what you consume, then your concentration will change. So then you, have a fit, uh, you won't have a fixed point. Then you need that the process occurring, the, the, the way the re reaction rates of the fixed point represent a self-maintaining process, can make in correspondence with a self-maintaining process. Or I define self-maintaining that can produce more, actually, not more, the same or more, and this has actually the very same. It's one particular case of, uh, of a it's a, it's a particular type of process that is also known in biochemical literature or petrine. Well, it's, it's, it, this, it, this has a hidden layer of complexity, mathematical, algorithmic, that we will not cover here. I just want you to, keep, to stay at the conceptual level. But this, uh, when we think of theorems, and, and it, you, you, get, you get hooked by the mathematics of it. But the corollary, okay, so we have that the fixed points, and this theorem actually can be extended to other stable regimes like uh, periodic orbits and uh, limit cycles. So organizations actually are like the abstract landscape of stationary states. That's the corollary. 
There are some, again, um, uh, let's say, worst scenario cases where you don't have exactly what I'm saying, but these are like mathematical constructs. Generally, in nature, in reaction networks you find in nature, you can tell that organizations are, uh, are an abstraction of all the possible stationary states. An abstraction, I mean, because a stationary state is actually a set of concentrations in the system. So, species 1 has certain concentration, species 2 has certain concentration. What I'm telling when I say an organization is all the species that have positive concentration, then I, I take the set of that, that will be an organization. So, you take a reaction network here, you apply the, the you compute the organizations, and you look at the phase space as a as a uh, Hasse diagram, this is called Hasse diagram, which is the set of subsets only. It's not the set of concentrations, it's not the, the vector space of concentrations. It's just all the sets that could have, that could be uh, stable or in principle. So this has a diagram. You have all the subsets here. You have A, B, C, D, four molecules, and then all the possible subsets, and then you can by using chemical organization theory, you can label these sets with properties, whether it's self-maintaining, close, close and self-maintaining, or no pro none of those properties. But you know that those green guys, the organizations, are the only candidates to be stable in the long run in your dynamical system, regardless of the dynamical rules even. If you use mass action kinetics or any other discrete or probabilistic, the organizations will always be those that will remain in time. Because the, the reason why they are, they would be, uh, the reason why they would be stable or they will be found in the long run is not depending on the, the evolution rule. It's depending on the very structure of the network and the possible processes that can be applied to it. So, this is a, um, in my opinion, it's a, it's a strong game uh, for analyzing a reaction network. I will explain this now. If you go in the regular way, you have the reaction network, you solve the differential equations, and then you study the dynamics. This is very expensive, expensive in time or expensive in, in computation. And it's multiparametric, and it's, it's just untractable with using co current computers or numerical methods. While if you take the reaction network, you first compute the organizations, you already know a little bit of the dynamical landscape in the long run. And then you can solve the equations around these points and find the solutions around what you already know that is uh, uh, a stable state. So this is the, the, the whole dynamical landscape of the system can be, uh, is much cheaper to, to find. So, but now, okay, so this is the gain, the theoretical gain of the theory, but important is this from a modelistic point of view, so from the point of view of someone who is making models. COT models systems made of collective transformations. So you model something thinking of an evolutionary process that is a collective transformation. And this implies that we have many species and many interactions and that stable metastructures, we call organizations, will emerge from this collective transformation. So, of course, this is what happened in chemistry, but if you look at this abstract level, this can be, mod this can be used to model any other system, not necessarily uh, a chemical system only. So, now I, I ask, is COT the model, the framework that we were looking for? Just summarize it. I said, do we have the chance to model many species? Yes. Many interactions? Yes. Do we have dynamical evolution? Yes. Do, can we model mechanisms? We can make many reactions to establish mechanisms, so yes. And are the analytic tools rich? Yes. So this is somehow the, the model that we were looking for. We, we covered the other models and we find that they all have some sort of problem, while these seem to point positively to all the aspects we were requiring before. So, of course, uh, the 
the proposal um, is to apply this beyond biochemistry. So go not just think of species are biochemical molecules, but now we can think of using this for modeling other, other systems. And this will be very nice to explain, but for time reasons I won't cover all the cases. But the first is a political system. So this was done by the same group in Germany who developed this theory in Vienna. They got inspired by Luhmann's theory of social systems, um, which states that a social system is an autopoietic process of communication. So then mm, species do not represent any more molecules, but communications. And then communications co-occur and interact and create new communications, forming an autopoietic process and this was uh, the proposal and was applied for a toy model of the political system where you can find how uh, basic structures of power emerge like uh, the first organization because remember you have the Hasse diagram and the first place you see something like a monarchy and then if you let other new communications to interact you have something like uh, like a democracy or something like that and it was interesting that uh, uh, public force was part of all the organizations in this. You, without public force, you in this model you don't have a political system. That was a very interesting uh, uh, result. Then, again, an economical system. Exchange and trade in the global economy can be seen as a large reaction network among goods and money. So, an organization will play the role of stable economies, not necessarily self-sustaining because they could depend on some resource, but still stable. They can maintain themselves. And actually you can you can make a model of this and, and track how dependent you are on a certain uh, good like uh, plastic or uh, or oil or something like gas. You can see because these things are just extracted and then used, used to push the production and then the economy. So this type of modeling could also bring uh, a nice, uh, uh, a nice view to these things that we all see, but we don't have actual models to, to represent. And the last one is the decision system, which which we did with uh, Pablo Marceto and others. Actually, some people in Vienna as well. So um, the influence of agents' decisions on each other forms a reaction network where organizations play the role of stable coexistences of strategies. So I will explain this because it sounds a little bit complicated, but it's not. So we will briefly review this last case, to just to explain, because what I'm bringing here is a case where reaction networks and chemical organization theory have been applied to model something that has no relation with biochemistry. So this is the prisoner's dilemma, uh, a classical problem in economics theory and also in, in interaction theory uh, in general, the theory of how uh, species interact, uh, intelligent species, the rationality debate, this uh, has permeated many, many areas of, uh, of research. Um, and, and it's about deciding your action when you know what happen if you choose something and another person choose something. So you might choose something to be very co cooperative, but if the other person is not cooperative with your decision, then you will go very bad and the other person will go very well. You know that if you go bad with the other person, you will go safe in a certain way, but you know that if both cooperate, both will go better, but you don't know if the other is going to cooperate or not. So that's the basic setting and it's used to um, study the emergence of cooperation. This is a much better case, because if each uh, hunter goes to get its own rabbit, they will just get rabbits, while if they work together, they can get uh, a bigger animal. But how did they um, realize about this? How did cooperation emerge? Because it, it is more complicated. If you go to hunt this, and the other guy tells you, yeah, I'm going to go to hunt that as well. But then all of a sudden he turns and takes the rabbit and lets you along with this. 
you will invest your time and energy into getting a big animal and you will not get it. While if you would have gone in the first place for your own rabbit, you will never have had the, the trouble. So the cooperation already exists in nature, but under this uh, view of selfish actions, go, you go safe being selfish, why then cooperation emerge if going selfish is, is always safe? That's basically the, the, the one way of explaining it. Okay, so prisoner's dilemma connects to the emergence of cooperation and how has this been studied? Generally using agent-based models, this became the dominant framework to study this problem. It's something that is called evolutionary game theory, which again, it's, again I will have to give some background to, to explain that, but, and I won't. So I, what I will explain is just whether you can model an evolutionary game theoretical setting using a reaction network. And the answer is positive, and this was this is the, the, the paper where we did it, Reaction Networks and Evolutionary Game Theory, in uh, 2014. This is the outcome of my first interaction with the field, so it's really beautiful to be presenting this one more time here. So, in the case of Evolutionary Game Theory, you have agents and you have a payoff matrix that tells you cooperation and defection. So these are the two possible attitudes. It tells you how good will you go depending on what you do and the other does. Okay? So this is the current setting in agent-based modeling to study the evolutionary game theory. But then what we did was to move, to lift the model, and instead of thinking of agents uh, interacting, we thought of decisions interacting, following a little bit what Dietrich uh, did for social systems with Lumen. So now we have decision species we think of a vessel of decisions and we live from the actual uh, physical shape of, of the agents or the physical location. And then we have that the decision species interact and create payoff species. We define the fitness of the decision. And then we can build a reaction network that is built directly from the payoff matrix and set up certain kinetic constants. In this case, we can also build the differential equations that uh, find the system and so on. And we did this little analysis to show, to really explain the evolution of cooperation, but in this new setting. We actually uh, recover all the results that were developed from the theory, and they were very popular results in their time. And we reproduce all these results, but using a completely different framework. So here is how the cooperation, uh, this is what explains why cooperation is, uh, the, the, what explains the paradox. So when cooperators are invaded by defectors, the, the rate of cooperation required to resist the invasion is much smaller than the rate of cooperation that you need when cooperators uh, invade a population. So that's the thing. In the end, um, I, I, it's, it will take me some time to explain this, but it's in, uh, what, the bottom line here is that you have a population of defectors, a population of cooperators, and then you change the proportions. So one is big and the other is small, so this means that the small is invading the big, and you can reverse this. And the paradox then is explained because the invasion is not symmetric. So defectors invading a cooperator's population are much more efficient than cooperators invading a defector's population. And what happens is that in order for a group of cooperators to invade a defector's population, the rate of cooperation has to be much, much, much bigger than the rate of cooperation they need just to survive with some defectors around. So this is basically the, the, what explains the paradox, how it, it emerged. And then the mechanisms of cooperation, of course, are family or, or certain bonds that allow you to trust and are related to our cognitive abilities of recognition and so on. And that's part, part of the evolutionary debate. Okay, so under the light of previous studies, we have seen that this theory can be an excellent candidate to frame the complexity stability problem for debate. And that's the Fondesit project that is now funding this, uh, uh, this grant that we started. 
Um, so, now we go to how to frame the complexity stability problem using chemical organization theory. So, species, we, we say, we have the elements of COD, the things that we define, and we have the role play in the ecosystem model. So that's, that's the, the, the framework. Species will play the role of ecological species, reactions will play the role of ecological interactions or mechanisms, I will explain this. Then processes will be possible dynamical regimes, so things that happen in the ecological system. Then organizations will be a potentially stable ecosystem. Complexity will be defined by structural properties like, I will say, number of closed sets, number of self-maintaining, number of self-maintaining processes and so on. And then the stability will be the density of self-maintaining processes uh, for, with respect to the reaction network. Um, this requires maybe a little bit more of explanation. What do I mean by density of self-maintaining processes? Well, imagine that all the possible sequences of reaction of a reaction network, and then put that, then that number on the bottom of a fraction, and then on top of that put the number of processes that lead to self-maintaining, that are self-maintaining. So the density of self-maintaining processes in the reaction network are the, the number of processes that make the system self-maintaining divided by the total number of processes, or the, the, the set of possible processes. Okay, so that's a, a, a trivial measure of the stability of a reaction network. And then you are not going to the differential equations here. It's just all algebraic. And that's what is, is, is good, but we are developing this theory now, so it's not yet ready. Other results that support this proposal is that um, organizations can be decomposed into dynamically independent modules. So, a self-maintaining process is actually can can be the, the structure of a self-maintaining process can be studied much deeper. It's not just a, a vector or a set of reactions. And depending on the structure of the network, you can do a lot of mathematics with that, a lot of uh, theory. And then using this this uh, result, we developed with Pablo Raceto uh, mathematical theory of structural change. So it's actually you take a reaction network and then you make a structural perturbation. That means adding a new species or adding a new reaction or extracting a species or extracting certain reactions. And of course, your set of organizations will change because the structure of the network changes. So the whole dynamical landscape changes. So this can be used to study resilience or adaptation or other uh, modern systemic dynamical notions. And for the first time, including not just changes of state, changes in the phase space, but changes in the structure of the system. So that's why it's a theory of change, structural perturbation or structural change. But this will go in the future. We just set the, the foundations of this in a paper which is going to get be published in, in March in the journal Systems. So that's, that's the big it's the beginning. Okay, now we go to ecological interactions and I, I'll, if we are about to finish here, we are very close to the end. So, very, just a very simple model of ecological interactions, just to show that all the ecological interactions can be modeled, because before we have only arrows or we have very complex equations or rules in an agent-based model system, now we have actually a definition, a very simple model of an ecological interaction. So that's the interesting thing, that we now make models of ecological interactions. We don't give them, we don't, we don't assume them given. We construct them by creating reactions and processes. I, I will go more in detail into this later. So, depredation. Prey plus predator to predator. That's a very simple model of what depredation is. And then parasitism. Host plus hosted to hosted. So, the hosted is eating the host. And then you can go and so on and so on with the other uh, ecological interactions. But this is, of course, a very uh, toy model of an ecological interaction. It's, it's too trivial. It, it will convince anybody. But it's just to show that the processes can be made, you can make sense of them by creating simple reactions. 
but the formalism, of course, allows for much more complex representations of these interactions. And I will present a couple of examples, like toy examples, to illustrate the idea. Because that's actually the last part of the project will be to create these ecological networks. And for this, I need to work with ecologists because I don't come from a strong ecological background. So, the food web, as I said before, was the, the, one of the dominant frameworks of studying the uh, complex stability debate. You define who is who, basically. And now I will make a very simple model of a food web. So, as I said, depredation before. Fox plus rabbit to fox. So, fox eat the rabbit and reproduce. Rabbit plus plant to rabbit. Rabbit eat plant and reproduce. Plant, uh, an average plant plus sun plus water to plant. Ah, sorry. This is plant eat nutrients and reproduce. And uh, sun is a free resource and water is a free resource. So this is a very simple reaction network explaining the food web of these uh, four elements. But now the first thing. This is a very simple model, but we can make it more realistic. For example, assume that species die. So we create these new reactions. Fox dies, rabbit dies, and plant dies. And we can go even more realistic if we want, and for the fox, assume that foxes have sexual reproduction and require food for survival. Because we here say fox plus rabbit to fox. Now we will decompose this process into something a little bit more complex. So fox is replaced now by fox female and fox male, and we add the species food of fox, and we replace R1, which is this process, by, and I will make a, a, a assumption here just for the sake that one of the type of foxes hunts, okay? So the male fox hunts and transform rabbit into food. And then I will make another assumption here, saying that a female fox plus male fox plus food makes them to reproduce and they always have one female and one male. So this is just for simplifying. All this can be changed. But what I, wa what I want to get here, what I want to get is to show that you start with a narrative, with a certain narrative of what happens in the ecosystem, and then you create a reaction network that represents this narrative. And you can deepen this narrative. All as much as you want by introducing new species and new reactions. So that's the first example. And the second example is the mutualism. So because I was elaborating on food webs before, but there is so many research in food webs that you say, why do I want another formalism to study food webs if networks are already so good? Ah, because you can also introduce mutualist uh, re re relations. And one of the most popular is the mycorrhizae cyan plants. And this is a simple explanation of what happens here in a, one of the foundational papers on this. So, mycorrhizae X, we will call it X, feeds from the roots YR of the plant Y and contributes to the production of mycelium XR, which in turn in turns increments the absorption capacities of Y. So, if you read this with care, care you will understand that they live Y and X live in a mutualistic relation by the elements X, R and Y, R. So, because the mycelium of the mycorrhizae um, increments the absorption capacities, so then it can grow further, it can grow more roots, and this feeds the mycorrhizae, so they live in a symbiotic relationship. You can put one arrow using a network model, but we create the process with four reactions. So we set up the mutualistic relation by making four reactions, which is exactly re reproducing this narrative here. So plant grow roots by having mycelium, plant plus mycelium grow roots. Then roots foster the growth of mycorrhizae, so X plus Y R to X, then mycorrhizae produces mycelium, and then mycelium fosters the growth of plants. So this symbiotic relationship is represented by a little reaction network. And this is uh, the, the, the game of applying reaction networks and then COT. So, as I said, mutualistic relation is represented by means of four reactions. Again, of course, because I showed before, this model can be coupled 
with other ecosystems models so i make a model of this mycorrhizae plant and then i can put the other plants and the bees and i can introduce the narratives of all and put them together and lead, and also they can be expanded to deeper levels of representation if i want to to say okay but there are di two different types of roots and one is eating more and the other you just put two new molecules and then create your list of reactions and then you apply cot and you will find all the stable states so that's basically the idea that we propose to study ecosystems. So, this is the conclusions, and to finish, um, current methods of, uh, for, to study the complex stability problem seem to not suffice, so there is a call for new methodologies. We have now introduced the reaction networks and COT as a potential candidate to meet the challenge because it's a mechanistic model. You can, the interactions can be built at deep levels of representation as much as you want. It allows for multiple entities and interactions and is mathematically suited to compute the stable regimes and study at a tractable way, in a tractable level, with only a uh, linear algorithm. Okay. Uh, but it's important to, to go, and this is uh, the reflection, that the reaction network represents a narrative of an ecosystem. So the narrative can be built with a reaction network and analyzed with COT. Then the narratives can be modified and extended and also multiple narratives can be integrated in a single uh, model. So this is the idea uh, that I have to invite ecologists and people who, who have spent more time than me on this to reflect and see if we, whether we can create a sort of um, framework or methodology to incorporate different ecosystems and put them in a, in a very in a large single model because we already have the mathematical framework to study that so that's the in this the, the, the final idea to invite and reflect and collaborate in this new way of modeling or new modeling paradigm for ecosystems and thank you i put this last picture which is uh the symposium where for the first time we discuss uh, these ideas in public. So, thank you.